Earth release. And yes, sir. Uh, I was one of the privileged few to have that advanced copy. And um, I guess the first question I want to ask you about is as a brain trust or as a thought leader, um, why the title of the book, Plantation Theory? Yeah, so plantation as a concept uh, just kept coming up as a recurring theme when I thought about Black folks' relationship to work in the United States. And, you know, the underlying elements of plantation theory, right, the conditions, the the output, the, the, the working twice as hard for, you know, no pay, um, <clears throat> uh, the relationships and the way you had to navigate uh, on the plantations or implantation, like it, it just all seemed to still be in place just in an involved form. And so that served as the backdrop to how I um, viewed and approached the black professionals experience and my own experience for that matter uh, underneath that umbrella and really calling out the connections between history and modern day reality. Got it. Well, I definitely thought that um, this was going to be, you know, a typical book about let's just leave and let's <laughs> just go. And um, the Underground Railroad is, you know, I don't know, drop shipping on Amazon. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, <Modern day>. yeah. <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised, though. Um, and this is one of the the uh, uh, the paragraphs that I wrote down. Uh, let me find it in the preface. It's um, it says. I'm writing this with the highest aspiration that my lived experience and lived experience with those who look like me provide perspective and purpose. I want the humanity of being black in a space that America designed with our inclusion far from mine to shine through. I want this future generation of black contributors to know that they're living a shared experience, but with more opportunity than those who preceded them. I thought that was an interesting way to start off uh, or interesting paragraph, not a way to start off. And like, do you feel like I, I know you wrote it, but do you really feel that the future gener generation of blacks are living a shared experience? Because this is a, you know, we are that first generation of digital, you know, we're blacks and working at home. You and I have this great mm -hmm. conversation, not in the studio, but on Zoom. That's right. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, the future generations will have options that we didn't have because of digital but there's still this this ages old battle between freedom and security right so granted you and i are working from home are we 100 percent working for ourselves defining our own destiny self-sufficient in a community that supported vertically integrated businesses completely reliant upon each other with a communal obligation no so so in some forms and fashions, that's why I said it's evolved. Now it's, you know, we have broader, uh, you know, fences or, or, or gates that cordon off the plantation, as it were. Um, and, and those gates aren't necessarily visible either. So, <clears throat> but they are perceived. And you talk to countless black professionals who feel this this underlying notion that they are capable of doing so much more uh, than what they have been hired to do and, and ultimately what they're responsible for doing within the companies they work for. And when you start to pose that question of, okay, well, how would you apply that brilliance, that excellence to something that you own? It's like, ah, you know, I'm not really an entrepreneur or, you know, not everybody's built for entrepreneurship. And I'm like, you know, not everybody's taught entrepreneurship. It's a different, it's a different statement. And so, yeah, the future generations I'm hoping will have more autonomy to choose between the premise that's been sold, which is go to college, graduate, get a good job, stay there for 30 years and then retire, right? American dream, or um, 
choose a different premise, which is get that degree, apply that skill, those these networks, this access to information and relationships, build your own <clears throat> and uh, and be a competitor. I think it's challenging the corporate America, or maybe I shouldn't say to corporate America, it's challenging to um, the American system of consumer consumerism ism to think about the employee or the worker. And so in that way, I would label this book as a radical book for corporate America um, to allow its employees or its employee <laughs> to not only write the book, but actually promote the book and actually uh, embrace the promotion of the book. So, uh, you know, how did you navigate that where you're allowed to not only promote your book, but your employer is actually backing your book? Yeah, so I, I will say first and foremost, I am a benefactor of universal timing. First and foremost, um, I left one employer um, where I was, um, you know, a small cog in a very big machine globally. Um, and, you know, that whole time I've always fashioned myself as an entrepreneur, right? I did what I was hired to do, plus some, plus had, you know, great networks outside of the organization, brought opportunity into the organization, positioned people, right, and, and moved uh, in a in a very different way than I think a lot of people move in, in in corporations, but I don't believe that I could have been doing what I'm doing today had I not progressed and moved forward out of that company into a a consulting firm and a, a very reputable agency in the employer brand space, where the president who I report directly to saw the vision what I had broader for DEI in general and moving that industry forward by really zeroing in on lived experience. And so, you know, through the lens of employer brand and helping companies figure out um, who they are and market that towards marginalized talent to attract them to work at their companies, but doing so in a way that that marketing actually matches reality. He saw that vision clearly, he was very upfront about my book that was coming out, what it was about and so forth. And he was like, I'm 100% behind that because he ultimately knows that at the end of the day, what we wanna do is do good work uh, that moves these industries forward and makes these employers better for marginalized talent. So I think it's, it's honestly a visionary move to be able to support the endeavors of your employee because there's a, not only a benefit for the employee, but a mutual benefit for the company as well. And to have that, that, that level of thinking and foresight I would love to see that model applied more in corporate America, where you have so many people who have, you know, startups in day jobs or side hustles in day jobs. Imagine what would happen if those companies supported those endeavors and how much productivity uh, and spotlight you could also receive on your company uh, as a result of that level of support. I think that's, uh, yes, I totally agree, imagine. You know, I hear John Lennon in my head when you said that. Um, and not sarcastically, yeah. you know, but but realistically. Oh, imagine. Um, the challenge with that, right, is that it almost also when you're talking <laughs> sarcastically, my brain mm -hmm. works works, you know, on different levels. And I heard the guy that yelled out and disrespected President Obama when he was speaking at the, yeah, right, lies. But the funny thing was happening to my brain was that I was like, I was putting together what you were saying. And then I was like, okay, the, the okay, so what John was able to do, he was able to find an employer that allowed him to do him, but in him doing him, it validated that employer in that said space or vertical, which then mm -hmm. would lead them to become a market leader in their own vertical, <laughs> which then allowed them win. to get more clients. <laughs> there, right. And so it's like, wait a minute, what the hell? This, this, is, this is a tuplet, this is a tuplet. Um, so I, I guess <laughs> one of the questions would be, um, you know, obviously, I, the, 
not getting into too much detail about how, but yeah. in the conversation you have with the employer, but in your head, because what happened was as I got to that space, that's when old boy popped up and said, lies, this can't happen. That's, you know, I, I understand you just figured it out, Martin, but it can't happen. And so um, how did you, <laughs> and you said you were a recipient of universal time, good, good, good timing. But how, mm -hmm. I think, and in, and in the beginning of the, the uh, I Star intro, we're playing, you know, some of your songs uh, as, a, as a rap artist. I think how, even in your, in crafting your music craft, you chose lyrics that were very specific and intentional. You chose beats that were also very specific and intentional. Your intros, very specific and intentional, like Wu-Tang Clan has our Ghostface Killer specifically, which shoots some really cool intros. Um, where did you get this intention from? I think mm. of the ability to be able to focus that intention mm. and say, um, I'm going to clearly go to this goal. I have a discussing this topic. But in going to that goal, it allows me to validate myself as an employee or as a, a, a thought leader in this in this vertical, in this area mm -hmm. I'm in, but I haven't sold out. I haven't I haven't spoke to the larger conversation, the more mainstream conversation. I've narrowed my focus to this one space. And in that one space, I'm gonna give you everything that's gonna make you go, ooh, whether I'm an employee or employer or I'm a I'm an industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to have fear of repercussions because I'm just going to be my authentic John self. That's what you've done in rap. And that's what I see you've done here. Yeah. Yeah, that's a hell of a question. Um, the intention for me has always been to enlighten, uh, to inform, and then to, to move people to a different way of thinking about topics that ultimately have become status quo. Um, and so, you know, whether it was in music, I remember in 2007, I was telling my people around me, like, I don't have any interest in performing on stage. I just want to be a 100% digital artist. And they were like, what? Nobody does that. That's impossible. You have to do shows. And I'm like, no, I don't why? think you have to. <laughs> You're like, why? <laughs> I'm like, I don't think you have to. And, and, and it comes down to what is the definition of success, right? But, but as far as this play, um, I'm so wholeheartedly invested in this belief that, you know, what has been done for 57 years as a, as a practice that is DE&I hasn't worked, at least not for the most marginalized talent in the market which are black folks. And that's not just me saying that, that's by all stats and measures by some of the most accredited companies in the world and consultancies and research firms and so forth. And McKinsey just put out an article or a report last week that doubled down on that, that very notion, said like lived experience is where the focus should be and improving that because by all of these measures and these metrics, black folks are still lagging behind. And so for me, it's so clear and I guess this is where I draw on that, um, you know, that Kanye level thing. Uh, for however people listen to this feel about Kanye and his antics and the way he expresses himself, nobody can deny that when the man has a vision, he can see it so clearly, regardless if people can see it now or 10 years from now. Yeah, you know, it's going to prove out. So I'm in no way suggesting that I'm the Kanye of DEI. But what but. I'm saying is lived experience. <laughs> but what I'm also going to say is, in a few years, people are going to be like, mm, he called it. No, no, no. But um, but seriously, I think you know, if we're not a drink, look. At the end of the day, I I could see so clearly that companies were never focused on the marginalized experience. It was really all focused on activity, and structure, and framework, and roles, responsibilities, and measurements. At the end of the day, who does all of that activity actually benefit? And I asked that question to so many DEI practitioners, executives, and the answers that they were giving never went back to the marginalized people that we were talking about in the first place. So I'm like, 
this has to be this. I I can't be the only one seeing this. So I'm not going to sit here and say I'm having this visionary idea. But I'm just I think I've positioned myself well with this book to to clearly articulate that lived experience of myself and other people that I've worked with at companies, um, you know, over the years to showcase this is what this is for us. It's big, bigger than a performative statement, uh, a commitment, uh, concern or compassion from the executive suite. This is how we experience these cultures, these environments every day. And if we're not working right. to improve that, then what are we doing? I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, pretty powerful stuff. Um, Thank you. There, I think there's a really interesting time period where companies will have to choose. Um, I think it was, it was Jamie Dimon. <laughs> he, he went back for Congress and said, <laughs> um, "Employees first. <laughs> or I'm sorry, he went he went before. Um, the business roundtable and said, we are now putting our employees first. after going to Congress and being uh, dealt with directly, we'll say. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But yeah, th that that space where there's a <clears throat> there's a Jamie Dimon, you know, there, there's a fortune five fortune 50. And mm -hmm. those 50 or you know, maybe it's 32. I don't know. But the slack, mm -hmm. maybe now Chase. You know, Shaker. There, there are like maybe thirty or forty companies that are like, okay, we're doubling down on employees. You're, you guys are getting your, you know, your, your above living wage, um, mm -hmm. and we're really trying to create a a safe space for you to work in. Um, what time period do you think is it? Two years, five years, ten years that it trickles down and becomes a standard, or and or is this an employee-driven versus a corporation-driven uh, movement or change, where people are starting to say, "I just saw a post today on LinkedIn where somebody posted, um, uh, someone asked them in the job interview, why did you move around so much? And so, uh, why did you not stay in the space, you know, for a short yeah. time? But why did you stay at companies? Because right. I'm not, I refuse to stay in a space where I'm not appreciated." And it, like, I don't think I was saw that ten you, years ago. Yeah. Yep. So now, you, now there's a growing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that was it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's a growing sentiment from, you know, marginalized groups that, you know, w we don't have to take this. Right? Like, we we can certainly find other places where we'll be valued. You know, and I and I, I dare say that there's a, a time limit on that as well. Right? At some point, that honeymoon phase ends, and you start to see the the reality of the company you're in, or you your management changes, or you know whatever the case may be, and then you end up going through it again. Um, the time frame on this is undetermined. Interestingly, you know, McKinsey put a put a time frame on if we stay the course and continuing to do the, the DEI initiatives as they are and have been, then you're looking at about 95 years for, for black talent to reach parity across all levels. If they start, if, right? And that's that's probably a, a gratuitous project, but if you, they're saying if you switch or you, you start to focus in on these lived experience gaps, um, that could be cut to 25 years. Okay. Okay, so then, you know, we're now talking about two generations being cut down to, to one, honestly. You know? So mm -hmm. I'm optimistic, but the interesting thing is there's no data to support what that could look like because it's never been done before. So we're literally at the bleeding edge or the forefront of what could be the evolution of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion as a practice. Uh, and with the you know proliferation of information and access and a rising uh, voice of Black folks and other marginalized uh, groups, that time could be cut down significantly if the right approaches are taken. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Really exciting. Uh, 
Another reason to buy the book. I'm optimistic. <laughs> I couldn't agree um, more. I couldn't agree more. And look, I, I give people some perspective on what's possible. And I, and I say quite early on in the book that this is not a solutions, tips and tricks book, right? Like you're not going to walk away with the, having the blueprint for your next DEI strategy. What it will provide you is better questions to be asking. Uh, that should lead to more deeper and robust discussions on what the actual problems are and for whom, and then how do we start to address those in an equitable way. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm excited about the book and its response. I mean, early responses have, have been tremendous. Um, and uh, I really I really want this to be embraced by, um, by black professionals and by allies and abolitionists. So you know, we're hoping it does some uh, some good work there. The question we love to ask our authors is a question that we've been asking since the MySpace days. And that is, when you ran it, if you ran to your 12 year old self, what would advice would you give him? Whew. 12 year old self. All right, I had to think about what year that was. Um, <laughs> well, I think um, I think I would have I would tell my twelve year old self um, trust the process um, understand that you won't be able to see up the winding stairs but you know that there's steps in front of you um, and and also be be less concerned. Um, you know, less concerned with, with how the world views uh, your approach and be more concerned with if your approach is sticking to your own integrity and your own vision and keep your eye on the bigger picture. So, yeah, yeah. That is, that's excellent. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a term that I did, I forgot to uh, ask you about, and I think a, just a, a definition, I think it's starting to bubble up. I'm starting to hear more people use it over and over again, but use it in a questioning form with like, ah, I don't know how this applies to to employment, but yeah, white abolitionists. <laughs> so um, Interesting. Yeah. concept of ally versus abolitionists. Can you define uh -huh. what, a, what, what does an abolitionist look like in the workspace? Yeah, for sure. So um, you know, I use an analogy of, uh, of running a marathon and an ally is, uh, uh, is the spectator on the side who's, you know, got the cup of Gatorade ready for you when you come by and they might even hop across the line and run, you know, 15, 30 paces with you. And, and then, you know, they get winded and tired and then they jump back on the sideline and root for you for the rest of the race. Well, we need abolition, abolition to not only you know, uh, move barriers, but also, you know, help pick us up if we're all, you know, if we're, if we're falling down before the finish line um, to ensure that the, you know, the race isn't fixed <laughs> or rigged, right? Uh, and also put something at risk on their, uh, their own comfort or status um, to ensure that equity uh, and equitable environments are created. So in a workplace environment, I mean, that looks like, you know, um, every everything from you know manager accountability, um, you know, in reviews and development processes where there's you know consensus having to be built in in rooms that you're not in and people that don't look like us in. Somebody needs to say something like, "No, I I know such and such. Their work output phenomenal, and they are deserving of that promotion. And I see you have such such and such, but." Clearly, they didn't perform the, at the same level. Let's do what's right. You have employee relations departments that are tasked with investigating complaints um, from Black employees or marginalized employees of microaggressive or macroaggressive cultures that they deal with on a daily basis. And unfortunately, there's no legal precedent or, or, or tools in the toolkit to, to combat those toxic environments that we know cause employees to leave. But there are things that can be done that are outside of the box that can advance um, 
the trust between marginalized employees and HR or the company as well. <clears throat> and I do have some of those recommendations in the book. But there's a lot that can be done that goes beyond just, you know, saying you're an ally on LinkedIn, but in the organization day to day, you don't step up and and put yourself on the line to ensure that equity is achieved rather than yeah. equality. So, Got it. You know. Yep. Like the definition, love it. Um, where can people purchase the book? Anywhere that books are sold. Um, if you want to go to plantation-theory.com, uh, you can certainly check out um, not only some more context, some uh, reviews, uh, some content just like this. We'll have this posted up as well, but also your pre-order purchase links as well. Excellent. How do people follow you? Where can they yeah. find, what do you want them to follow you and tap in at? Yeah, all my socials will be on plantation-theory.com. But if you uh, want to reach out uh, on LinkedIn, just search John Graham Creative and I will be at the top of your search results. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Instagram1906 and that's Graham like the spelling of my last name. Uh, and certainly on Clubhouse uh, where we have uh, plenty of engaging conversations under the club moniker of plantation theory, the struggle between freedom and security. So I can be found on all socials. That's what's up. All right. Thank you, yeah. Brother John. Appreciate you. And looking forward to you, this uh, USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestselling title we'll have on there. We know we're going to get to Amazon. That's nothing. So that's done. And, yes, you sir. Yes, sir. Others. From your lips. It's to God's ears, sir. Let's oh, make yeah. It happen. I appreciate Classic. it. Thank you for the That's opportunity and the platform. Re Black 365. <laughs> That's right. Got to make sure we do that. Yes, sir. Now, the funny thing is, I don't know how to, I've never done a recording. So, like, I've never.
right. So we finally are here almost a month before release. And yes, uh, I was one of the privileged few to have that advanced copy. 